Okay, well, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, my name is Andy Scott. I'm uh, one of the reference librarians here at the Franklin Public Library, and we're glad you're here for this event. Um, just going to introduce our speaker here. Dr. Sandra Jones has lived her entire life in Milwaukee, earning her doctorate from the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee in 2004, where she also earned her bachelor's and master's degree. Go Panthers. <laughs> she uh, served as an assistant professor in the Debar Department of African and African Diaspora. Diaspora, I know. <laughs> Diaspora Studies and as an assistant director of the UWM Cultures and Communities Curriculum Development Program. She retired in 2015. She's the author of a number of journal articles and also the 2021 book Voices of Milwaukee Bronzeville published by the History Press, in which she uses information from her interviews with residents of the historic neighborhood to give readers a look at what it was like to live, learn, work, and play there. So, Dr. Sandra Jones. Thank you so much for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I hope you enjoy what I'm about to share. Um, so, Voices of Milwaukee Bronzeville. How did I decide to focus on this um, property? I live in Brewers Hill in Milwaukee, and just down the street, two doors away. Uh, one of my neighbors, his name is Bill Nolan. He's in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, he and three of his friends, um, they've known each other since they were eight, 10 years old. And they get together every Friday. And their families know each other. They, um, go, they belong to the same church. They have activities and so on and so forth. And every Friday they get together at Bill's house, and they just talk <laughs> about stuff, you know, growing up in Milwaukee. And so uh, after hearing some of their stories, I decided to barge in there with a tape recorder. <laughs> <laughs> and they welcomed me, so I went in with my tape recorder, and um, I started recording their stories. And, and it, it was really Bill who gave me the idea for the book. Uh, there have only a, been a few books about Milwaukee Brownsville. And and I should say, none of the people I interviewed ever called it Brownsville when they were growing up there. It was just where they lived. It's come to uh, have that name because actually Brownsville, there is a, a original Brownsville in Chicago, um, but Brownsville has become a generic name for communities in different parts of the country where a large population of African so, but, um, so, um, um, like, uh, like I said, they didn't call it Bronzeville, it was just where they lived. Uh, the few books that have been written about it uh, have focused mainly on the businesses that grew up in Brownsville, grew up and around Brownsville. You know, uh, Milwaukee was a very segregated city, and black people were really confined to that area of the city. Um, and so they did what black people do. They made a way out of nowhere. Uh, and they built their own community. They built their own businesses. So the books that have been written up to now focus on that. I wanted to focus on the people. I wanted to focus on the life that people lived in Brownsville. So I started with my friends, Bill and his friends, and just to the uh, uh, east of he Bill is Mamie Thurman. Um, she's the oldest person in the book. She just turned, she will be turning 97 this year. Oh. Oh. And then I found some other folks. Uh, altogether, I interviewed eight people for this book. 
I wanted to do more, but I was stopped because of COVID. Mm -hmm. oh. You know, so I couldn't, uh, you know, the population I was looking for um, was uh, vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so I really had to cut it short there. But I got eight interviews. Um, and um, I chose people who were born in Milwaukee between the 1920s and the 1940s. And I chose that demographic because they experienced the whole of Brownsville. Brownsville only existed for 40 years. Around 1920 is when it began, and by the 1960s, it was done. And I'll go into that, you know, why that was uh, a little later. But they have the whole experience. Um, now they're in their 80s and 90s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and when they go, that's their story is going with them. You know, so I wanted to capture that. I wanted to capture some of that. Um, so I started the book. Yes, sir. Imagine a Milwaukee with horse drawn wagons traveling down the city street and a man atop yelling, Oranges, oranges, oranges for sale. When you were a little short of money, you could buy on credit from the corner grocery store to feed your family supper. When milk was left fresh daily in your home's milk box and taverns stayed open all night. <laughs> when Lapham Park was the community meeting place and at some point during the day, everyone stopped there to go swimming, to play baseball, or to take a sewing class. And electric cars, street cars, extended throughout the city. Some people don't have to imagine this Milwaukee. They simply have to remember. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to capture. I wanted to capture their memories. And I uh, have to tell you another thing. Um, when I started talking to the folks, I came in, you know, I'm a, uh, a trained journalist. I go in with my list of questions and I start, you know, asking questions and, you know, I'm thinking, you know, the housing stock in that area was built during the Civil War and, you know, it must have been terrible. They didn't want to talk about that. <laughs> they had no interest in remembering that. They wanted to remember the joy of their life. So I took those questions and I just threw them away. I threw them out the door. Um, so that's what I have here. I have their joyful memories, and, and that's what I was able to capture in the book. Um, so, Voices of Milwaukee Browns. I started out um, actually looking at the history of African Americans in the state of Wisconsin, um, because uh, black folks um, migrated one way or another to Wisconsin before Wisconsin was a state. They came to Milwaukee before Milwaukee was a city. Um, some of the uh, personalities that I found were the most famous, Jean and Marie Banga. They came on a uh, British ship um, to Michigan, mm -hmm. upper Michigan, uh, in the 1700s. And um, they came <laughs> enslaved. But you know, in the this part of the country, um, there was no slavery, you know, in the North Northwest Territory, and so over time, especially when the the, uh, the commander of that ship who owned them passed away, they gained their freedom, and they stayed in the state. They were fur traders. They had a family. They raised a family, and their family worked in Upper Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota for many <coughs> years to come. So those were among the first. Uh, residents of Wisconsin. Uh, another one was um, Marie, Anna, uh, Marie, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't see it. I can't see it, but I got her right here. Um, 
Marianne LaBouche. She was actually the first female doctor in the state of Wisconsin. She was of French and African heritage, and she settled around the Dishin area. She had 13 children, wow. and she raised her children uh, in, in Wisconsin or, uh, around that time, in that era. So there was no slavery in Wisconsin. However, there were a number of slaves who, um, enslaved people, I should say, who were brought to um, Wisconsin, the, the, the uh, Wisconsin Territory, Northwest Territory. Um, and one of the, at, when, when um, their white, and I, I don't like to use the word owners, but when their, their white uh, so-called owners migrated to Wisconsin um, to work in the mining industry, um, they came with them. But because there was no system of slavery, many of those people eventually um, became uh, free residents of the state. Mm -hmm. In fact, because there was no slavery system in the state of Wisconsin, it attracted many other African Americans to the state. To the territory and then the state when it was founded in, in 1848. Two of the most famous were Caroline Quarles <coughs> and Joshua Glover. They were both from St. Louis and actually escaped enslavement in St. Louis and made their way to Milwaukee. Um, and uh, uh, Caroline Quarles, her story is quite well known. Um, she first landed in Chicago, then she, um, when, and, and when a person escaped enslavement, um, slave catchers track them, find them, and take them back to where they escaped from. Um, she landed in Chicago, slave tra 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 uh, catchers tracked her, and she was able to get away to Milwaukee. When she got to Milwaukee, she was befriended um, by a African-American um, uh, barbershop owner here in Milwaukee. Um, he actually turned her in when he found out there was a $300 reward for her capture. He turned her in. However, Milwaukee was also a really big hub of abolitionism. And so word got out to the abolitionists that Caroline Quarles was about to be recaptured. They rescued her. They went and found her, rescued her, and helped her escape um, from uh, this man's house, hid her in a pigsty on the Milwaukee River. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a, a friend's meeting house <laughs> in that spot where mm. she was hidden. They eventually. Um, were able to spirit her away uh, to Canada, where actually she um, lived for the rest of her life. She had six children. Um, so that was one of the stories. The other was Joshua Glover. He was uh, escaped again from St. Louis and uh, captured and taken to a Milwaukee jail. Um, <coughs> abolitionist again broke him out of the jail, put him on a steamship, and he also sailed away to, uh, to uh, Canada. So there was um, an attraction to Wisconsin because there was no slavery, but after they strengthened the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850, which meant that slave owners could go anywhere and, and, and recapture people that was supposed to be their property um, and take them back, it put those people who had come here in jeopardy. And so many of them just left. So for a long time, Milwaukee's African-American community was very transient for that reason. However, over time, <clears throat> there began to be some stability to 
Milwaukee's black population. And here's a chart. So you see in 1840, there were 22 black people in the city of Milwaukee. And over time, it increased. Um, 1850, 98. By 1940, which is during the time that these folks, the people that I interviewed, um, uh, were born and growing up, there were still less than 10,000 mm -hmm. African Americans in the city of Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. So it was still a very, very <coughs> small population. Um, some of the first early Milwaukeeans, Joe Oliver, who was the first black to vote in an election in, in Milwaukee, he actually voted in the first election hmm. held in Milwaukee, I think it was in 1838. Uh, Solomon Juno was elected mayor. He was actually a cook for Solomon Juno. Oh, he came to the state, to, to the city with Solomon Juno. Another um, family, William and Ann Anderson, 1841. They are the oldest continuous black family in Milwaukee. So they really sank the roots uh, for the black community in Milwaukee. Robert Tidball, he was the one who befriended uh, Caroline Quarles. <laughs> he befriended her. Uh, he was the first to get married. Uh, and he married um, Sarah Abel Brown in 1842. Um, he owned a barbershop in downtown Milwaukee, uh, got into a little bit of financial trouble, and uh, he left <coughs> with creditors trailing him <laughs> out of the city. Uh, his wife, Sarah Brown, Abel Brown, stayed, and she opened a um, dress shop in downtown Milwaukee. Uh, Sully and Susanna Watson, own a considerable amount of property. They are very well known in the city of Milwaukee um, as some of the pioneers of black Milwaukee. They were featured in the um, Milwaukee Museum in the streets of old Milwaukee. Um, John Durbin was another property owner in uh, Milwaukee. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Plankington building down in downtown Milwaukee. Well, he sold it to John Plankington. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing. <coughs> Black people who were early residents of Milwaukee were pretty economically well off. Mm -hmm. uh, not only that, they could live anywhere they wanted to live. Um, so they lived on the east side, some lived on the south side, or they lived all over the city because racial tensions did not uh, prohibit them from moving around and living a life um, that came much later. And by 1960, you see the population uh, exploded and continued to explode. So Milwaukee now is a majority minority city for a number of different And so what created the black brown boundaries in Milwaukee? There were a number of things, as I said, as I said, before this time, black people could live wherever they wanted to. But um, about 1910, a large number of Italian immigrants came to the city uh, and they settled on the east side of Milwaukee where Many African, well, there were, were African Americans had uh, uh, lived. They pushed African Americans west across the river, and that became a barrier to them living on the east side of Milwaukee. The central business district, uh, the Civic Center that grew up downtown during that time, also pushed black people away from um, the southern part of the city. You know, um, many black people live, you see the, this building here, that's a uh, tenant house, tenant building. Uh, and black people lived in that on State Street in Milwaukee. 
Uh, so it was a residential area, yeah. but as the civic <laughs> center and the central business district began to develop, it pushed over that population to the north. Um, and then restricted covenants blocked African Americans from moving beyond Walnut Street. So what became the black community, the segregated black community, was, let's see, Walnut on the south, I'm, I'm sorry, Walnut on the north, Highland on the south, 12th Street on the west, and MLK, what was 3rd Street, on the east. And that became where African Americans were concentrated. And many people believe it was an all black community. And it wasn't an all black community. Black folks shared that community with Jewish people originally, because it was originally a Jewish neighborhood. But it, what it was, it was the only place in the city where black people could live. They were segregated stuck in that area. And Milwaukee today remains one of the most segregated cities in the country. Over time, you know, by the 1960s, you can see the, the borders of Brownsville expanded. It had to, because by 1960, there were almost 75,000 African Americans living there. So, uh, and I mentioned before that the housing stock in that area was already old and decrepit. Mm -hmm. There was a report done in 1942 that said most of the housing stock in the Bronzeville area was unlivable. Mm -hmm. So that's a little overview of the city and the state. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about these people. You know, I, I, I said before that one of the reasons it was important to me to collect these stories because these folks lived the whole experience and when they go, that experience is gone too. So I, I wanted to capture that. And uh, I'm sad to say that already two of these folks have already left us. Uh, George Sanders left us actually before the book came out. <coughs> and Robert Mosley uh, passed away about a year and a half. And that just reinforced to me the importance of capturing this. So we'll start with George. George uh, was born in Milwaukee in 1931. I asked George which hospital he was born in. He replied, hospital? What hospital? <laughs> he said, I was born in a cold water flat on 3rd and Walnut. <laughs> uh, his parents arrived separately in Milwaukee in the late 20s. Maddie, his mother, came from Gallatin, Texas. His father came from uh, Tennessee. I'm, I'm sorry, Gallatin, Tennessee. His father also came from Tennessee. They met and married in Milwaukee. Um, Henderson worked a variety of jobs, including at Alice Chalmers and the Milwaukee uh, North Shore Railroad. Uh, he was also uh, in the Governor Warren Knowles administration for nine years. And here's Mamie Thurman. <laughs> I love Miss Thurman. <laughs> she lives on the corner and uh, up from where I live. She was born in 1927. She's the oldest person in the book. Uh, she was born at the Milwaukee County Hospital. And she's lived her entire life in Milwaukee. She's the third generation of continuous black families in the city. Her father, Emmett came from Topeka, Kansas in 1906. Her mother, uh, Mamie Anderson, uh, came from Chicago in 1910. They met, were married in Milwaukee. When Ms. Thurman was born, her family lived in a duplex on State Street, uh, just across from where the safety building is located now. Later, they moved to North Fifth Street, where they lived for 17 years. Uh, she married uh, James in 1947. They raised five children. Uh, he was considerably older when, than she was. 
But I gotta tell you a little bit more about Ms. Thurman. <laughs> Ms. Thurman said to me the other day, she says, you know, Sandra, I'm, I'm, I'm getting old, she said. She said, I only get to walk part of out of me once a week now. <laughs> and she takes a cab. <laughs> and many days in the summer, you can see her out there in her, she has this huge lawn, it's immaculate. And um, she's out there picking weeds and, you know, mm -hmm. She has so much energy and so much, uh, uh, what does she have, you say? Joy. Joy, Joy. yes. That's yeah. yeah, so that's the start. Robert Mosley, he was a historian. He was quite a historian. Uh, Robert was born at the Milwaukee County Hospital in, in uh, 38. His maternal grandparents came to Tucker's. Uh, were the first to arrive in Milwaukee. They were originally from Louisiana, Missouri. Uh, they migrated to Cedar Rapids, Iowa in 1917. When his mother was one year old, the family settled in Milwaukee. The Tuckers were among a group of 25 black families that lived in Bayview in the 1920s. That's the south side of, of Milwaukee. Um, Bobby's paternal grandparents, James and Jeanette Mosley, arrived in Milwaukee in 1919. Also from Cedar Rapids, they lived in tenement housing near uh, St. Benedict's, the Moors. They originated from Atchison, Kansas. His parents met as students at Lincoln High School. Bobby grew up on Ninth and Galena. Uh, he built a career working in finance and worked the uh, banking at the first Wisconsin National Bank as a loan officer. He also worked at the North Milwaukee State Bank, the first black bank in the city of Milwaukee. This is a picture of Bobby when, with his two little sisters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, you can't spot him, but he's one of those kids up there. Um, and there he is. <laughs> sitting on Bill's back porch. <laughs> and here is Mr. Bill Nolan. Bill is a fantastic artist. Um, he retired some 30, now 40 years ago, and he turned his attic into a uh, art studio, and he's sitting up there painting for 30, 40 years. Wow. We were able to acquire a few of those <laughs> art pieces of his. But this is his grandson here. You can't see this whole one, but that's his wife. And that's just another one of his pieces. But Bill was born uh, at New in Milwaukee at St. Anthony's Hospital. And Bill was born, most of the others were born at the county wow. hospital, or now what is Freighter. But Bill was born at St. Anthony's Hospital because his father had, had a job uh, and he had insurance. Um, so that's where he was born. I was also born at uh, St. Anthony's Hospital. Mm -hmm. His family lived on 7th and Walnut and later moved to 9th and Vine. Bill says that in the 80 years that he has been alive, he has never lived north of North Avenue. Bill's father was a butcher and came to Milwaukee when he got a job at Patrick Cudahy. His mother was a homemaker for most of his childhood. She was excellent at crocheting and she would share her skills with her neighbors. Uh, one of her neighbors, a Jewish woman um, who lived across the street, they would sit for hours at her kitchen table and she would teach um, her friend how to crochet and her friend taught her Yiddish. <laughs> and so she said she would uh, go into the shops. He said his mother would go into the shops uh, around the neighborhood and, and she would start speaking Yiddish. Yiddish. And she, he said she loved to freak people out. <laughs> uh, Bill attended Layton School of the Arts. After graduating, he worked at Dimble Schuster's doing window displays until he was drafted into the Army. He received training in dental work in the Army and 
uh, found employment at the Veterans Administration Dental Lab, where he stayed for 31 years. Hmm. Uh, Bill met Annie, the woman he would marry and share his life with. They dated 10 years before they finally tied the knot and they raised four daughters. They raised Annie's four daughters. Hmm. Um, Mr. Blountrell, <laughs> Dr. Reuben Harpo, he was born in 1934. His family lived on 4th Street and Garfield Avenue. When he was eight years old, his mother uh, moved to, he and his mother moved to West Summer Street with his grandparents. Reuben's mother and maternal grandparents moved to Milwaukee from Little Rock, Arkansas. His father came from Kansas City. His parents met as students at Lincoln High School. Harpo school served as the University of Wisconsin School of Continuing Education for 31 years as a senior outreach specialist. Uh, he raised a lot of money for the university. Um, in 1998, he went to work as a program officer for the Helen Bader Foundation um, and continued his rant writing and collecting abilities. And that's Ruben sitting on our porch <laughs> today. Mr. Joe Deku. Uh, Mr. Joe Deku was born officially in Wauwatosa at the Milwaukee County Hospital. According to his mother, he was born on the 11th in Walnut when she was on her way to the hospital. <laughs> And I love telling, assuming the voice of his mother, he says, she says, you wasn't born in Wa no Wauwatosa. You came out of me when they was taking me down the steps <laughs> on 11th and Walnut Street. He says, you was raising all kinds of hell. You was hollering more than I was hollering. That's <laughs> <laughs> Joe remembering his mother. <laughs> Joe's father and mother moved to Milwaukee from New Orleans when his father got a job at uh, Plankington Packing House. Joe's family moved to 9th Street, which was 9th and uh, Walnut, which was the heart of the business district. Uh, when he grew up, <coughs> where he grew up, he uh, operated, he was the first black person to get a, a parking lot mm -hmm. in downtown Milwaukee, and he operated parking lots in downtown for over for 35 years. Mm -hmm. And Joe is quite a character. You see this picture at the top here. He, when he was in the ninth grade, he had a singing group. And I can't recall the name. You know when you get old, you forget stuff. Yeah. Right? That's where I am. But uh, the, the keynotes, that's what I'm prepared for. And they opened for big name groups at places in Milwaukee. Uh, and um, you know when you see him talk about it, when you see him remember those days and the experience he has, you, again joy, mm -hmm. and that's what they that's what they wanted to focus on. And this is little Joe right here, mm -hmm. and his brother and another friend of theirs, Raymond Washington. Raymond uh, was born at County Hospital in 1937. At the time, his family lived on uh, West Galena. Five years later, they moved to 9th Street. They were neighbors with Joe and his family. Um, the Raymond family set down roots in Milwaukee in 1932 when his great uncle, Joe White, came from uh, Greenwood, Mississippi, looking for work. Two years later, Joe sent for his uh, sister's family, including Raymond's mother, there was a second generation of his family to grow up in the city, and they lived for many years uh, on North 6th Street in a cold water flat. And this picture here is uh, uh, Raymond's children mm -hmm. at the top. And that's his wife, Beverly, and that's Joe. Sharon and Larry Adams. And Sharon is the baby <laughs> in the book. She was born in 1945. Uh, her family at St. Anthony's Hospital, her, her family came from um, Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, and actually, things in Memphis were getting really 
difficult for uh, black people. And her father was actually accused of some kind of um, crime. He was cutting an apple, and they uh, accused him of vanishing a dangerous weapon. And that was too much. And so he upped, he picked his family up and left. They had friends in Milwaukee, and that's how they ended up um, here in the city. Um, Julius, her father, worked as a supervisor at Milwaukee Railroad as a point man and stayed in the job until he retired. Sharon remembers that he took her to every job that he worked. I drove to Milwaukee Railroad and watched my dad switch the train tracks. Uh, after being away for 27 years, Sharon returned to Milwaukee in 1996. So the reason I came back was to restore my parents' home. In the process of searching for someone to help, she met the love of her life, Larry Adams. After only a year, the two were married. They carried on the spirit of Bronzeville by becoming leaders and transforming their neighborhood. Um, the couple, along with their neighbors, founded the Walnut Way Corporation in, 2000, in, in the year 2000, and now have developed uh, Adam Garden Park, which is, which is an environmental hub on Fond du Lac in Milwaukee. These are two of my favorite pictures in the uh, Book. That top picture is Sharon when she was about 10 years old. Her parents found her a Rita doll. And Rita was a black doll. And this is the 1940s, so how difficult it must have been for them to find that doll. And here's Rita today <laughs> with Sharon. They both look pretty good, don't they? <laughs> and that's Larry. And so these are four guys that I, I was telling you about in the beginning, and they meet at Bill's house, and they, uh, they just talk. You know, when, when I brought my tape recorder in originally, you know, they just talking, and they talk over each other, and so I had to separate them. <laughs> but um, I'll just read this. While segregation meant that the people in Brownsville were confined to a particular area of the city did not, not mean the community was denied essential and basic needs. Black people created their own elaborate economic social structure. They opened and operated many restaurants and eating establishments, barbershops and beauty shops. Everything was available for dry cleaners and tailors to entertainment venues, <coughs> social clubs, and sports teams. The I-94 highway cut across the heart of the community, and the shops and the housing stock is long gone. But that landscape still lives in the memories of some of the folks who came of age in that space. I had a chance to walk through an area where Bill used to live, uh, and this is what he told me. And, and I had a tape recorder, so these are his words. He said, I go through there now, and I get a visual of what was there before. All the taverns that used to be on Juno, you know, as far as entertainment, eating and living. Yeah, you can see where there was a restaurant, Clara's Restaurants, which was a very famous restaurant, by the way, um, which was a very popular place in those days. But there's not a sign showing it but I can visualize where it was. It's actually on the picture, it's that picture up there. Um, but nobody would know if you weren't raised in that time. You wouldn't know that this is the restaurant where all the black entertainers came uh, from out of town uh, where they had to come to eat dinner. At that time, he said, we had our hotel, you know, where there used to be a big mansion on 4th and Galena, the old Slicks mansion. They made it into a hotel. If you look at it today, it would be like one of those big mansions that you see on that drive, but they tore all that down. Hmm. So that's that's his that's his memory. Hmm. He can see it. He can hmm. still see it. Um, they also told me stories about living across the racial divide. Um, 
Oh, I, I, I kind of already mm -hmm. told you the story about this is Siba <laughs> and the grocery. They mm -hmm. had a grocery store. Um, they exchanged uh, culture, mm -hmm. crocheting and Yiddish. <laughs> um, Mamie, if you remember, she said we had a nice neighborhood on Fifth Street. It was mostly white people. We had a few colored people. We lived near a person, Lawyer Hamilton and Dorsey, Leroy Simmons and Isaac Cobb. I did a lot of walking and signing people up to vote during that time. And that was one of the other unique things about Brownsville, because it was the only place in the city where uh, black people could live. You had all economic classes uh, living in, in that area. Uh, and so they knew each other. And there was a little, there was an advantage to that, especially for young people, because they gave them role models, you know, they gave them examples of how to accomplish things and, you know, and, and to dream, even to dream. The other thing I got from them was understanding that work ethic. Uh, George Sanders, he says, talking about his mother, she did work, day work, if you know what that is. You go and clean up other people's houses. Generally, all day work, all day work people would meet up someplace on Third Street. Then they would be picked up and taken out to Shorewood, mostly Shorewood, upscale white folk. And they would be picked up, and when they got off work, be brought back to the hood. That's the way they worked and they would call that day work. And a lot of women, a lot of black women did that. Black women also ran boarding houses. Mm -hmm. uh, and boarding houses were very important because as people came to the city um, from the south or wherever they came from, they needed places to, leave, to live. So those boarding houses provided that living uh, space. Jill says, when your mother has so many kids, you know you ain't going to get no new bike. He says, you know you ain't going to get certain kinds of clothes. So you get a paper rock. My mother could do nothing but put a roof over our head and provide some food. I got a job at a restaurant to keep money in my pocket. I used to sell rags. I used to sell cardboard. Um, we, so, we, sold, we sold that to try to make it. A lot of people don't know what a hustle is. We use, um, we used to cash in bottles. You could cash in Coca-Cola bottles at two cents and get money for them. So that, you know, that drive to work was there. Uh, uh, George told me another story about his father, and I'm going to share it with you. His father was a construction worker. And at one point, many of the black construction workers were fired, you know, who worked in the city of Milwaukee. And so he says he remember he woke up one morning and the men were sitting around a stove, a, a wood burning stove, and they decided that they were going to go and get their jobs back. So they got up and they walked down North Avenue, he says, uh, to, um, I guess the area now is Humboldt mm -hmm. and North. Mm -hmm. That's where they were doing some construction work and they had bats, <laughs> and uh, they walked down there, and the, and the guys who had taken their jobs, the foreman told them, go back, go back to the shop or wherever. And he says he and his father and his friends went and picked up the tools and just started back to work, and nothing more was said. <laughs> but you know, the, that uh, determination, that's what that was, determination to take care of their families. That's what that was. And there were all kinds of stories like that, I should say, from these folks. Lapham Park, that was the social center of the neighborhood. Up until 1940, it was actually restricted. So black people couldn't use it. But after 1940, it became open. And it really became this, uh, a center point for the community. Uh, Bobby said at some point during the day, practically everybody was at Lapham Park. That's where they met as kids. He, they said that they didn't go to each other's houses. They met at Lapham Park. 
where they would play basketball and baseball and um, have all kinds of fun. That's an aerial view, and this is the social center um, that has classes for adults and uh, all kinds of things. But Bobby says, we went to school, then we went home and maybe grabbed a snack, then headed up to Lapa Park. See, that was like a gathering place. It was a playground. <coughs> they had everything there. At Lapham Park, you had two sides, the girl's side and the boy's side. <laughs> we all remember that. <laughs> Growing up in school, I do. Um, although you could go back and forth. The boy's side was the most popular. Of course, he would say that. <laughs> I think that everyone was there. They played softball and football and everything you could think of. We had two basketball diamonds. Uh, and at some point during the day, practically everybody was at Lapham Park. We met folks through Lapham Park. We didn't even know where they lived. We never asked where people lived. And the thing is, it was open so long, from early morning until 9 o'clock at night. And at some point, Lapham Park gained a swimming pool. And the community really fought for that swimming pool. And it was a huge pool, um, scanning a few city blocks. Um, Joe that who swears that's him. <laughs> um, Bobby says the swimming pool was open in the summertime from about June to September. A lot of people didn't realize how big the pool was. The pool was about a block long, brown on the north, and it went all the way down the reservoir. And from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. it was free. I would go home because I only lived a block and a half away. I would eat lunch and then at 1 it would open again from uh, 10 to 4. If it was real hot, it stayed open until 9 p.m. And Joe says it was almost like Olympic diving because there were a lot of diving competitions that took place at um, Blackwood Park. He said that. Every so often, before the swim time was over, the divers would congregate around the diving board. Everyone knew and would say, they're getting together over there. They'd be trying to outdo each other. One guy would do a double flip, the next guy would do a triple flip. <laughs> and there was one swimmer, uh, actually he was really a renaissance man, Sylvester was his name. Um, and he was quite a star. He won statewide competitions for swimming, uh, and he was there, and, and they idolized him. They really respected him. Sylvester for all of his talents. He was also a football player and uh, an artist and um, many other things. And so just like the neighborhood, the schools were also segregated. So there were only a few schools that African-Americans could attend. Um, like the housing limitations, the schools available to African-American children were within the confines of Bronzeville neighborhood. For elementary schools, uh, children attended 4th Street, 9th Street, and Lloyd Street School. Um, and that's Lloyd Street. I actually went to Lloyd Street mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Um, most of the teachers uh, for Junior high, it was Roosevelt, and for high school, it was Lincoln High and North Division. Um, most of the teachers in the schools were white. Um, it was only in 1946 that the NPS policy of hiring black high school teachers began to change. And that appears Roosevelt Junior High. St. Benedict's the Moor. Um, a number of the folks who I interviewed went to St. Benedict's. Um, St. Benedict's the Moor opened uh, and operated a Catholic school for African American children in 1912. Classes were conducted for all grade levels and included a boarding school that drew uh, students from Milwaukee and Chicago and other cities in the Midwest. St. Benedict's was the only Catholic boarding school serving African-American children in the country. Mamie went to St. Benedict's, Benedict's, and she remembers a typical day. She said, before school, you had to go to church, 
a half an hour to 45 minutes. When we have breakfast, a peanut butter sandwich and a glass of grapefruit juice. For lunch, we go to my grandmother's house for a hot lunch. Then we go back to school. I worked with a man who taught me how to typeset and things like that. We never learned anything about black history. But as a result of the work that St. Benedict's has done, there, there was and still is a large African-American Catholic population in the city of Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. uh, so they left quite a tradition. Mentoring children. Watching over and mentoring children was a huge enterprise in Milwaukee Brownsville. You might say that taking care of the youth was a community project. Parents carried the greatest responsibility, of course. However, the responsibility extended beyond their front doors. I asked Ruben who his mentors were. He responded, almost everybody, the whole neighborhood. He did speak specifically about his grandfather who raised him, but he also spoke, spoke about others in the community. Sharon talked about her teachers. Uh, she said, I had teachers that cared about drama and how we spoke and how we carried ourselves. Lorraine Carter was one teacher that she remembered specifically. She was a wonderful educator. She would have social activities, we had program and etiquette, we had program in public speaking, and we would have and we would have things to say, and she would correct us and encourage us. She was the teacher that groomed us. Uh, so mentoring of children was again really important uh, in the Brownsville community. I can't remember which one of them it was who told me this. They said, um, you did something on the street, you would get chastised, you know, by whoever. And then by the time you got home, they would have them reach your parents <laughs> and you'd get chastised again. <laughs> so, you know, it was, uh, it was a community effort. Bobby tells a story about this coloring book. He said, I had this old coloring book and a kid, his name was Bobby Hunter. He went, he wanted that coloring book. He said, I'll give you $20 for it. Next day he came to school with $20 and he bought the coloring book. I told all the kids to follow me to the store because I was gonna buy everybody's penny candy. Now back in those days, $20 was a lot of money. You could feed a family for a long time with that kind of money. The storekeeper took the money and gave it to my teacher. <laughs> the teacher contacted, my, contacted the kid's parents and found out he took the money out of his mother's purse. <laughs> they got the money back and he gave me back the color. <laughs> I'm not sure what else they got. <laughs> but, um, you know, but just that connection, you know, that, that looking after each other was, was really And then Bill tells a story. Urban League. Urban League was an institution in the community that played a very important role, especially for new folks migrating from the South to the city. It helped um, people get housing, it helped people get jobs, food, and so on. So it was, and Bill lived just across the street from the Urban League. So he tells a story about uh, Charles Singleton, who lived right next door to me. We, Bill and another young boy, got into a fight, and I don't even remember what the fight was about, but we were just slugging it out, he said, just duking it out, fist to fist. He must have been about seven, eight, nine years old, and slugging. Baby Joe Gans came across the street. Golden Globes was under the urban, was underneath in the basement of the urban league. Um, Baby Joe Gans grabbed me and the other guy by the collar, picked him up, took him downstairs in the basement, threw him in the ring, put 16 ounce gloves on him and said, okay, go to it. And he said, they swung and they swung and they swung until they fell out. The gloves were so heavy, mm -hmm. they could hardly lift them. Um, <laughs> And so Bill says to me, 
That was just mean. <laughs> and I said, Bill, that was just love. <laughs> I was teaching you how to channel that anger, you know, into a different, uh, different direction. So I got to add this. So um, I looked up Joe Gans and discovered that Joe Gans died before Bill was born. <laughs> I was like, oh no, here's the problem with memory. <laughs> but then I said, wait, no. And I put in Milwaukee Joe Gans, and sure enough, oh. baby Joe Gans, who took his name from the original Joe Gans, oh. worked at the Urban Leagues as a boxing trainer. And so that validated Bill's story. Sure. And it showed me, don't ever doubt their memories. <laughs> don't ever doubt that they remember correctly 60 years ago, maybe not yesterday. <laughs> and so that's Baby Joe Gann up there, and those are some of his boxing. Bill said he did box uh, after that. He got into the boxing mm -hmm. program until he got knocked out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and he said, no, that's, that's enough for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of other stories, mm -hmm. and I, I would really urge you to get the book. You're all in here. Um, did anybody have the book? Mm -mm, not yet. Okay. Right. Many other stories. You know, when I uh, went down to talk to Miss Thurman, she pulled out pictures and letters, and she had letters that her father had written to her mother from 1916. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, all in the book. Most of the pictures in the book came, I've never been published before. They came from their private collections. Mm -hmm. So and I was very fortunate. I was very fortunate to be able to talk with them and to get these stories and to put it right down. But as I said, Rhyme <coughs> only lasted for 40 years. Um, two things called the end of it. Uh, the first was um, urban renewal. As I said before, the housing stock was very old. It was unlivable in many instances. And so the plan was to tear down the old houses and to build new ones. Well, they tore down the old houses, but they didn't build new ones for many, many years. And so that uh, pushed many people out of Brownsville. But the, the, the big event was the uh, construction of mm -hmm. Highway 43 that went right through the heart of mm -hmm. uh, Milwaukee, Brownsville. Uh, and the Mar Marquette Interchange and Highway 43 that goes up north. So that's what, that's Brownsville. Mm -hmm. That's where it used to be. Um, and so um, about 8,000 people were, 8,500 people were relocated. Um, the few people who did own houses never got any payment for those houses. Um, they didn't? No. no. And, and the, the, the owners, um, home ownership was really low anyway. But, um, but you know, they just picked them up and moved them out. Um, I guess there's a upside to the story. Mm -hmm. There are other black communities that began to spring, spring up. The first one is Hillside um, that sprang up, and many, that's where Bill lived, Bill and Annie, and many others uh, moved to Hillside, which is uh, very close to the neighborhood. Uh, Halyard Park, Halyard Park is an area uh, where middle class African Americans live. It was established, uh, I think it was around the mid-1960s, um, it's a very small community. It's one of the uh, grew out of Brownsville. Lindsay Heights is another, and the largest, of course, is Harambe. Um, and these are some of the signs. So that's the story mm -hmm. of Brownsville, or you know, Milwaukee's first black community. There's a lot more in the book, and I just mm -hmm. wanted to give you a snapshot. Any questions? Or anything you'd like to say? Yeah. Um, um, Dr. Jones, this is a kind of 
comes after the period you're talking about. But could you say anything about the uh, what I would call the, the, the revitalization of Brownsville through the Martin Luther King uh, Business Improvement District? And yeah, that, there, that whole group. There is an attempt to revitalize, and and I wouldn't say revitalize Brownsville itself, mm -hmm. but the spirit of Brownsville. And it's being led uh, to a large degree by Malele Cox, all the women from mm -hmm. Malele Cox, uh, and there are others um, you know, who are involved in the project. And I think it's a wonderful thing. You know, We have the Black Holocaust Museum, which is on North and um, Fourth and North Avenue, um, which is a part of that. But even down by Vine and Walnut Street, there are Black-owned businesses springing up. There's one wonderful place. It's called Honeybee Sage Apothecary Cafe. Have you been there? I have. We. I, I'm with a group that was fortunate enough uh, to have some of the leaders of the uh, business improvement district take us on a trolley tour, uh -huh, and uh -huh. we stopped at some of the shops. And right. They gave us a wonderful lunch at one of the restaurants. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. So, so it is. It's bringing back yeah. the spirit of that community because. You know, when I um, named the book, I, I, I it went through several versions, but finally the publisher said, why don't we just call it Voices of Brownsville? I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Milwaukee Brownsville. <laughs> mm, right. I wanted that distinction because, uh, you know, it's important. Mm. It's important. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. I had a vague sense of, of the boundaries of Brownsville before coming here, but you know, uh, realizing that um, my husband's grandfather uh, lived in Brownsville mm -hmm. and his dad, Tupa, oh, yeah, yeah, and were part of that group that obviously had to move out. And I, I didn't realize till you said it they were not paid when uh, they were when they were moved out of there for the um, for the interstate. So uh -huh. yeah, it's just yeah. interesting to. To learn more about that area, about where you know their family came from. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Know, you. It's, yeah. Thank finding you. research for this book was really difficult. Yes. Yeah. It's really difficult. Yeah. Fortunately, I was able to. You know, the two books. One is called um, the Walk of Brownsville, um, and the other is called uh, Brownsville: A Lifestyle hmm. by Amina Ivory Black. I was fortunate to find some um, dissertations mm. that mm -hmm. had information about early Black Milwaukee. Mm. Uh, it was helpful with newspaper articles, um, and things like that. But you know, and if we don't get this history, mm -hmm. it's gonna be gone. You know? mm -hmm. So that's why I thought it was so important to, to do it. My next book, <laughs> you know, I realized that. The people who were born in Brownsville is only a part of the story. There were many people who migrated to Brownsville, um, and their stories are just as important. Um, so the next book is going to be migration stories. Nice. Migration stories to Brownsville. Hmm. Anything else? I heard somewhere that that, that well, Sure, it was. But uh, did you find anything in your research that, like that, that the the that forty three like that was a very strategic political and you know move there. That was like to you know get everyone to, to destroy the that community. Well, and, you know the you know, the plans for right the plans for the highway. Yeah, it included thirteen different highways. Okay. The original plan. And there were going to be highways going around the lakefront. There was one highway that was going to go through the east side. And at least for the east side, and I imagine for uh, the lakefront, the community had political power mm -hmm. and they stopped it. And I don't know if people remember, but for a long time, uh, just along Water Street, there was a highway to nowhere. Yes. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Because they stopped it. Mm -hmm. They said, no, you're not taking that to our community. Mm -hmm. The black community had no such political right. power. Yeah. You know? So what started out as 13 different highways 
resulted in two. Only two. And that. But, you know, the other thing is that this happened in many other places around the country. Mm -hmm. Were you able to include in your book uh, pictures of some of the original structures that were in that area? I, I was not. I couldn't find many. You know, I, I did find that one of Lapham Park Pool. <laughs> yes. But um, I just, there's a, um, one of the things I do in my spare time, you know, I still teach. I retired, but I still mm -hmm. teach. Uh, I am the executive director of an uh, acre and a half urban farm called Victory Garden Initiative, mm. and we grow we, right in the middle of hills of, of uh, Harambe. Mm -hmm. We grow everything; everything we grow is organic, and it's all free to the community. Mm. So people can come in any time, day or night, and pick the collard greens and tomatoes and the corn. And the, we have a fruit orchard in there. So, but anyway, we were a part of an exhibit of an art display uh, that Mayak mm. put together, the mm -hmm. Institute of Art and Design. Art and, Design. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I saw side-by-side -side pictures of Bronzeville before the highway and mm. Bronzeville after the highway. Mm. You know, and it's pretty, it's pretty startling. Yeah. You know, you see houses and things like that, and then you see concrete. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, it was very difficult to find. You know, I had that aerial shot of Lapham of Lap Park and uh, the uh, social center there. You know, so I was able to find a few things, but not nearly enough. You mentioned the Black Holocaust Museum, and then I thought there was another, it's like a little small, is that the Black History Museum? Or I don't remember the, the Black name Historical Society. That's what it was, the Black yeah. Historical Society. Claiborne Benson. Yeah, so another place where you can have or yes. Right. Right. They have a lot of events and things like that. I don't know how often you get to Milwaukee, but you should visit some of those places. Yeah, I've been to that one. I haven't been to the Holocaust Museum. Oh, you really have to go to the Holocaust Museum. I remember going there as a kid. Oh, really? Yeah. It, it, they have a different building now. Well, I was going to ask about that because yes. I thought they had they had closed it for. Didn't they close the it museum did close for, for a while? A while. Yeah. Because there's a brand new. It's like in a new building. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, they just got some a couple of years ago a really big um, donation. Nice. Anonymous. So you said Fourth and North. Fourth and North. Is it about where that is? Okay. Elaborate on the Holocaust Museum. Like, what's the body? It was founded by um, a survivor of a lynching. Yes, right. Cameron? I think that Cameron. history is part Cameron. of Cameron. it. James Cameron. Yeah. 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 Dr. Yeah. Dr. James Cameron. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he started the Black Holocaust Museum mm -hmm. um, on North Avenue. Mm -hmm. I just can't yeah. remember how many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it tells a lot of the history mm -hmm. of. Um, not just black Milwaukee, but you know, black people in general. Um, but, the only one like it in the country. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. I, well, I don't know now. No. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I went to have the opportunity, I was in D.C. and had the opportunity to visit the National Black yeah. uh, History Museum. Yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable what they have in there. It was um, there's, there's also a um, history museum on lynching, but I can't remember. Oh, yeah, right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I don't remember, but I remember seeing it. It sounded it's horrible. Horrible, horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they had actual, yeah. The nooses. Yeah, them. yeah. I, I can't remember who Where it, it is. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. It's important. It is. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we have to, you know, we have to remember that stuff. Yeah. Right. Because um, it happened. Yeah. And more than it, it happened to people. Yeah. You know, and if we're going to respect humanity, we have to respect the humanity of those people who suffered. Mm -hmm. You know? So. Um, the work that you're doing is very important because a lot of that is that, that oral history that it's no 
where else do we found like you said it's really hard to do that research when you've got things like you know it's coming in, in people's memories and, right and sometimes you can find concrete evidence but you need that oral history first to then get the nuggets to go and then ah, now contextually this is important and it's real right. or this and now you have somewhere to start but it's that yeah. it's, it's like bill's story mm -hmm. <laughs> and he and he told me i did some more research and i found out some more to it right you know, yeah. to, more to add to it. so it's called the national memorial for peace and justice and it's in montgomery alabama This, I'm, I'm, this has been lovely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Where can you find it? Online? Or I just got it from Amazon. Yeah. Oh, two minutes ago. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, I think it's out, it's going out of print. What? So you should get yeah, it. I, yeah, I did say there were two oh, copies. Sweet. Two copies. Oh. Are you serious? Yeah. Like where it's only on the other side? Like where else? Um, it's, well, I'll actually, it's Barnes and Noble. Like Boswell. 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 Yeah, there's a bookstore. But you don't have it here. No, I don't. I tried to order some and they said, we don't have any more. So I'm going to try to get them to do a second printing. But you might be able to get it from, you know, those Some of those businesses, right? Or right. like with the. I, I I I I've had two people tell me they saw it in Walgreens. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. oh yeah. they yeah. have that those book counter. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, right. You know where else you might look if you're ever downtown? Go to the um, uh, historic Milwaukee. Uh, their their shop on the corner of Michigan and I think it's Broadway. And what is it called? Historic Milwaukee. Oh. Okay. Uh, and they have a lot of a books. lot of that. Uh, okay. And you know what you could do is even if you don't want to go down there, sure. Go to their website. Sure. They list all their books. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if there's a if there's a demand, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> there's a demand. Then I agree. Second. Can you just hold it up? It's too big. Can I get a picture? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to get a head start.